Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Open Mic. We're talking about wrongful convictions today. We're talking about forensic sciences with an amazing person who's an expert in all of these things, forensic sciences. She's the executive director for the Center for Integrity in Forensic Sciences. And it's in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where my daughter is going to college. So that's awesome. They are experts in problem solving with forensic evidence, wrongful convictions, especially in baby uh, syndrome, shaken baby syndrome cases, talking all things forensic, whether it be hair analysis, blood splatter analysis, all those kind of things. And it's a new nonprofit co-founded by the former Wisconsin Innocence Project director, Keith Finley, and the lawyers, Dean Strang and Jerome Budding. Well-known guys that, that you may remember from the making of A Murderer fame, which was a huge series in my life. I loved watching those couple seasons. Uh, Judson, Judson now educates lawyers, courts, and the public in ways that forensic science can be less than scientific from flimsy foundations of bite mark science to the inconsistencies of error rates of fingerprint analysis and hair comparisons. Really excited to talk to Kate today, so let's bring her on open mic. You never know who you're going to see. Be one guy one-on-one -on -one my whole career. What you're going to hear. You got a lot of desperate people in the city. Or what they've got to say. When you can take people inside of a crime. That's what you're going to hear on my podcast, Open Mic. Find it where you find your podcasts. Hello there. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Thank here. On Open Mic, we talk about all the stuff that you're talking about. We've never really focused right on the forensic sciences. And you gave a quote to, to my producer talking that the U.S. has had over 2,500 exonerations since 1989. Is that number right? Yeah, I don't know the precise number. It actually changes really frequently. People are being exonerated every, you know, every week. And so uh, we're close to that number, but I um, but we're above it now, and I'm not sure what the precise number is today. So you know, I'm on a lot of the pod, uh, a lot of the uh, listservs, and a lot of the you know, I sign up for the newsletters, and you're right. It feels like every single week there's a wrongful exoneration. Uh, that's that that they get somebody gets out of prison who was in jail for, or prison for many many years, and it's like I can't believe that it's happening every single week, and you know, are you guys tracking what percentages of these are because of forensic sciences? The data that we have now shows us that about a quarter of them, uh, it's something like 24% um, are due to faulty forensic science. And that's forensic science that's overstated or, you know, just plain wrong. Um, as in the case of the um, lab scandals where, where um, analysts, you know, did fraudulent reports. But more more commonly, what happens is analysts make make errors, or <clears throat> they state the science with more certainty than it than it really allows. But you know, Mike, the number twenty five hundred and some change is probably a vast underrepresentation of wrongfully convicted people, because of course the only folks who end up on the registry of exonerations are people who have gone, have been convicted, have gone through the entire process to have their conviction overturned, right? And then have either won their new trial or had the case dismissed. So we think that that is probably a major underrepresentation of wrongfully convicted folks. So let's take a, let's just take a step back for a second and, and tell us about the forensic evidence, forensic science evidence and why it's such an important part in criminal trials. Absolutely. Uh, one reason why it's it's a really important part of criminal trials is that juries are very convinced by it. Um, when someone hears that science shows that a person is guilty, juries are very likely to believe it and to believe those analysts. Um, that information is presented as objective, as not yeah. opinion. And so it's very convincing. So it is convincing. And, you know, what, what are, tell us about some of the common problems that you guys are seeing when it comes to forensic evidence, forensic scientists. Um, I mean, you know, I think most people listening to this and watching this, you know, watch shows like CSI and, and have seen on the news, um, you know, the D DNA is part of this, right. Mm -hmm. And in blood splatter, we just did an episode last week on open mic, the staircase, um, mm -hmm. uh, trial, uh, 
um, with a with a faulty blood splatter analysis, which convicted somebody wrongfully, um, or they they say is wrongfully. He didn't get exonerated, but that's a different story. Um, but but you know, take us take us through this and and um, um, you know, common problems, common issues. Sure. So a really common issue, something that happens in about 60% of cases in which someone was wrongfully convicted with forensic science and later exonerated, about 60% of those cases involve um, an analyst who overstated what the evidence showed. So they stated their conclusions with more certainty than the evidence would warrant, or they gave um, they, they gave the impression that the discipline was um, more reliable than the evidence actually warrants. And so that's the most common issue. More rarely, um, we see issues of just fraud. Um, analysts who said they did experiments when they did not do them, uh, or that they ran analysis when they, when they didn't. Um, or, you know, dishonesty about a piece of evidence, either the testing of it or where it came from, that kind of thing. But that's much more rare. Um, generally, what's going on in these cases is a phenomenon that all human beings are susceptible to called cognitive bias. And that means that for a variety of reasons, you, um, you believe something that's not true because of other factors. Um, and, and that's something that every human being has just by virtue of being a person. Uh, you can't you can't really get rid of it, and it's not your fault, but it does lead to these errors. So we have to make sure that we're taking steps to correct for for this kind of um, cognitive problem. So the lawyer we had on last week was talking about that it's a you know uh, the prosecutors and the police come up with their opinion, and then they try to find the evidence and they make it fit into to what they um, want it to be, and they, they get pigeonholed and they get you know focused hyper-focused on it. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that you find to be true? Yeah, so that's a great example of cognitive bias. Tunnel vision is one kind of cognitive bias, and that's when, um, in, in the criminal legal context, that's when investigators latch onto one um, suspect, for example, or one theory of the case and abandon others, maybe, maybe wrongly. Um, and then the other thing that comes into play there is, an, is another bias called confirmation bias. And that means that once you've made up your mind, any piece of evidence that you see, you're more likely to accept it if, you, if it agrees with the conclusion you've already come to, and you're more likely to reject it if, for example, it's exonerating. And that makes sense. I mean, we all have that, I think. And I think a, if a prosecutor or a police officer or detective makes up their mind they're going to make it work. I mean, they're gonna, they're, they're, that tunnel vision, the, the bias is just gonna kick in and, and I think everybody can understand that. And I think, you know, talking about it the way you talk about it and teach lawyers and the public about it is so important because one reason we do this show is, you know, the, the, the wrongful conviction episodes that we've done, I want potential jurors to hear these episodes, to think about it because when they're sitting in a juror box, I want them to have some skepticism. And like you're saying, there's not much skepticism when a scientist mm -hmm. is on the stand saying, this blood splatter means this. This bite mark means this person bit the person, even though it's not true. And it's a hard thing to disprove as a lawyer, isn't it? It's a hard thing it to It absolutely disprove. is. You know, th that's really, and it's really tricky because literally every person has bias. It is a psychological phenomenon. We cannot keep, we cannot will ourselves out of having bias. Um, and it's nothing to be ashamed of, but it is something to recognize. And I think we're at a place now, especially in our society where we talk about bias, like it's something we can help. It's something we can change. And, and while we can change the results of it, we can't help that we have these inherent biases. W what, what we can do is we can work to counteract them. We can build safeguards into our system so that people are protected from the bad effects of them. But just, we can't stop ourselves from being human and having human brains. That's why we need to build a system that, um, that, that accounts for that and counteracts it. One of um, your specialties at your um, clinic and uh, your expertise is in the shaken baby syndrome cases. Is that true? Yeah, mm -hmm, We've that's done right. lots of cases around that. Can you tell our audience 
you know, what are the major flaws with that diagnosis in those types of cases? Sure. It's a really complicated issue because um, while there's no doubt in anyone's mind that children are abused and that they can sustain head and brain injuries as the result of child abuse, what's in doubt in these cases is whether a particular set of findings points unerringly to child abuse in the, without any other explanation. Um, so while you know we no one would ever dispute that sometimes children are that children are abused and sometimes they're they're seriously injured as the result of abuse, what the issue the issue where this comes into play is when prosecutors and doctors um, come into the courtroom and they say this particular set of injuries can only have occurred from child abuse and had to be have been intentionally inflicted. Um, and that means with the intent to cause serious injury or death. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about the problems with shaken baby syndrome, and which is also called abusive head trauma. Our audience on Open Mic um, had, have listened to and watched an interview with Julie Balmer, mm -hmm. um, someone who was uh, wrongfully convicted of a shaken baby syndrome case. You worked on that case. Your team wrote an amicus on that case. Is that what you told me? Not not that one, a different one that was later. I wasn't, um, I wasn't Atkins. involved in, in Julie's case. That's right. Mm -hmm. On Ackley, okay. That's I'm right. Wrong. On Ackley, which is a massive case here in Michigan. Um, but you're familiar with Julie Balmer's case and, and she, yeah. you know, the way you were just describing it, you know, the doctors said, you know, she abused um, her nephew who she was, who was in her custody. And it turns out he had a congenital issue. And after many years in prison, she was let out because of um, Michigan's Innocence Clinic, quite frankly, and, and their great work. Um, so that's what you're talking about here. And it's it's such an important thing. And, it, and you know, they isn't it true that they recently changed the name Shaken Baby Syndrome to Abusive Head Trauma Cases? Yeah, that name change was recommended in 2009 by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it's it's trickling through the system. Um, some doctors have, have begun using it exclusively and don't use shaken baby syndrome anymore and others don't. But yeah, that was a name change that was recommended about 11 years ago. And what, I mean, what is your best advice on those types of cases? And, and, you know, in your, in your, in your positions and in, and who you um, teach and lecture to, you know, the doctors and the hospitals and the police and the detectives, um, you know, they seem to jump right for that when there's not a better explanation pretty quickly and they disrupt mm -hmm. lives and they ruin lives and families. Mm -hmm. You know, what, you know, if, if you were able to get in front of all these people and tell them something, what, what's your, what's your stance on this? Well, I think there are a couple of important things to remember. The first thing that is important to remember is that there's no way to to do what um, some prosecutors and, and, and child advocates talk about as erring on the side of the child. That means that in the absence, what I think what they mean by that is that in the absence of certainty, you can, you can protect the child by taking them away from their family. And that is a fundamental error in, in thinking, because if you believe that you can, you can help a child by removing them from a family when you're not sure what happened, um, you need to recognize that that can also be very harmful. And I think there's been a lack of real ac accountability and realization that removing a child from a family is always harmful. It's harmful to the child. It's harmful to the child's family. It's harmful to the adults in the family and the children in the family. And sometimes it's necessary, but it should only be undertaken in the, in the when it is most necessary and most certain. So that is one thing that I wish people would think about, that it's not harmless to remove a child from a family and it's not always harmful to leave them um, within the family. I'd also encourage folks, lawyers, anyone who could potentially be a juror to approach these cases with appropriate skepticism, right? If it sounds um, if it sounds too too certain, too, you know, too clear and you have questions, maybe there's a good reason for that. So if a doctor is saying the only reason why someone might, uh, a child might manifest certain symptoms is because they were abused and you see no reason um, or other evidence of abuse, then that's the time to be skeptical and search for other options. And I would also encourage anyone who is involved in the medical care of children to, to recognize that when they prematurely diagnose abuse, that that might mean a child who needs necessary medical care is not getting it. 
Um, and so that's also a really significant issue. I think part of the reason why misdiagnosis persists in these cases is because we have a desire to protect children, we all do. Um, and I think it's easy to say that this is a way to protect children. The other reason why I think this misdiagnosis persists so much is that, um, uh, excuse me, is, is that most of the time when doctors suspect that a child has been abused, they were. And so that allows them to, to, again, retain these cognitive biases, right? They can say to themselves, the last hundred kids I, I diagnosed as having been abused or I determined had been abused were actually abused. Because, and I know that because there was other evidence, someone um, else witnessed it, for example, right? Um, and then I think that allows them to believe that they're more infallible than they really are. And so then when these mistakes come along, they don't recognize them for what they are. That's an interesting point that, that sometimes I forget that, you know, there are, there are bad people out there who are abusing infants and um, the doctors probably see m way more of that than mistakes or congenital issues or falls that may not be consistent with a typical injury, but actually quite frankly did happen that way. But they, they they are so jaded because they see so much abuse that their first reaction is it had to have been a parent or a or a caregiver or a, or a loved one watching the child. Yeah, and I think like many areas in forensic science, the 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 prosecution side of the equation, I mean, it, 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 you know, they're not particularly invested in changing the system because it's working because they honestly believe that they're, um, I think they honestly believe that they're protecting kids, that they're, you know, making sure that parents and caregivers who do terrible things to children are appropriately, um, you know, they have they pay the consequences for that. Um, but, you know, the problem is like so many forensic sciences, it ends up being such a slam dunk case when there's a doctor saying, I know it, without any doubt, right, or with very little doubt that this child was abused. Um, there's not a lot of motivation there. If you're, if you're, if you're winning and you're feeling good about the, you know, the outcomes of your cases, there's not a lot of motivation there to make the change. And you've seen that in so many other kinds of forensic science. I mean, the, the, um, you know, the obvious example is, is bite marks, right? So when the, when the first bite mark exoneration started coming out and it became really clear that bite marks were absolutely junk science, that they were just not reliable. Um, there were, you know, you'd go to the, you know, the, the national meetings of odontologists, right? Like the American Academy of Forensic Science, for example, and they would literally say, right, that, that the people who were litigating these wrongful conviction cases were on the side of the murderers and the child abusers, that they were going to, that they were going to allow more of these crimes to occur by taking away the tool of bite mark identification. And that's the absolute wrong way to look at it because if no if somebody's not getting a fair trial in this system we cannot trust it our, our system is absolutely based on on the you know on the assumption that everyone gets a fair trial or on the and the on the principle that everyone gets a fair trial my impression as a layperson and a lawyer is that they are accurate because you know the bite marks everybody's bite is a little different and we have a different molar here and a crown here and it makes a mark and blah 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 right Mm -hmm. um, tell me why I am completely wrong. Well, the first problem is that we don't know if that's true. We don't really know if um, human dentition is significantly different to the point where a bite can be identified um, with any kind of specificity. But what's more important in this case, and 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 even more kind of uncertain, uh, or or what is more certain, right, is that skin, the human skin, is a terrible substrate for capturing data about teeth, right? So skin, um, it does a terrible job of capturing any kind of impression because it swells, it bruises, it's elastic. Every person's skin is different. Um, being, you know, uh, dying or being dead can change the, can change the texture of the skin. Uh, there's so many ways that skin is a terrible, terrible way of capturing data, a terrible substrate. And so what, um, you, you know, even if you are confident that everybody's teeth are different and, and to some extent that's true um, because we can use, there's a, there's a really um, 
good use for forensic odontology, which is identifying um, people who have been killed with their dental records. But that's very different from the biting surfaces of their teeth, giving any kind of useful impression that can be used to identify a person. But what's more important is that uh, marks on skin are very difficult to identify. And in studies where, you know, experienced bite mark examiners were asked to to examine pieces of skin that had been bitten pieces that they used um they used pig's skin and put and had people bite them and and or had um had a machine you know use teeth to bite them and people were not able to identify what was a human bite mark um or or what wasn't right and you see that in other cases there there are famous cases where um animal marks from animal scavenging on bodies was called a human bite mark um, and then the people were later ident identified with their, the people were later exonerated with DNA and the real perpetrator identified. So yeah, bite marks are, bite marks are a serious issue. So Kate, you made me realize, that's why I love these, these podcasts and talking to smart people like you, because it makes me realize how messed up our thinking is, you know, the bias comes from when people die and they, and they're burnt in a fire and they look at their dental records and they're able to identify the person. That's where my inherent bias came from. You were right. I mean, I didn't realize it wasn't probably a TV show. It was probably, you know, when somebody's burnt in a fire or they're not recognizable, they'd go to dental records, right? We've all heard mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and then, so in a criminal case, if they're saying bite marks and dental records, it's an inherent bias that those are accurate. And, and, and the fact that you just taught me and our audience that, you know, that their skin is not, you know, it's not like going to the dentist and having a mold made for your implant your braces or whatever you're getting done to you that makes a ton of sense um mm -hmm. and so i just learned something really good there <laughs> thank you um well, how biased i am and how wrong i am <laughs> well thank you for flattering me um but you know the legal system to some extent knows this and we have cases with precedential value that that say it's important for the um, science that you're seeking to bring into court in a particular case to be well enough related um, to the research that underlies it, right? So, so for Wong, because I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about cases like Fry, right? United States Supreme Court case that said that um, a particular discipline had to be well enough related to the thing it was purported to show in order for it to be admissible in court. And in that case, that case is a great example, right? Because in the Fry case. Uh, that conviction was overturned because prosecutors used systolic blood pressure, right? So they were taking a person's blood pressure to, and asking them questions, sort of like a lie detector, but not quite, to figure out whether they were lying, right? What the court found was people's blood pressure does sometimes rise when they are lying or for any wide range of other things because they're nervous about being talked to by the police, because they have a health condition, because they're uncomfortable, because the question makes them upset, even if they're not lying about it, right? So, you know, in, in cases like that, where courts have said, no, like just because part of it is true doesn't mean that all of it is true, is something that we can look to. It's, it's something, it's a place where our system, flawed as it is, is trying to get it right. And, and, yeah. And, and as you were talking, like I see here that, you know, you've done a lot of cases on hair analysis and, and fingerprints, you know, hair analysis, you're talking DNA, fingerprints, you're talking fingerprints, uh, which are unique. DNA and fingerprints are unique, very different than bite mark analysis. Um, so it's all fast. I mean, it, it's all it's all really fascinating. You know, Kate, you started off as a public defender and, you know, lots of these wrongful convictions are are unfortunately from public defenders, court appointed attorneys who don't have the same resources as the prosecutor's office. You know, now that you're doing what you're doing and you're, you're able to see both sides, you know, what needs to happen in order to equal the playing field between public defenders and court appointed attorneys and the prosecutor's office? Yeah, well, I think it's important to educate prosecutors so that they understand what is and isn't good science and what the, um, what the science and the evidence can bear out. But the other way that we make change in our system and in, in, in the perhaps the most important way we make change in our system is through the adversarial process. And so what that means is that if you're gonna have a battle, everybody comes armed, right? So you don't have a well-funded prosecutor's office and on the other hand, an underfunded 
under-resourced public defender's office where, where lawyers don't have enough time to do their cases, they're overloaded and they're not getting paid enough. Um, it, you, you brought up court-appointed lawyers, which can in some ways be an even more serious problem because people who are court-appointed on cases may be worried about um, things that public defenders don't have to worry about. Public defenders get a salary. They don't have to worry about paying their rent. They don't have to worry about paying their support staff. And so in some ways it can be, um, it, you know, it can be even more problematic to um, have a court appointed lawyer who isn't getting paid the way that they should be getting paid and isn't being given the amount of time to work on the case that they should. We see this uh, all, all, all the time in forensic science cases because they are so complicated and so time consuming. Our cases require multiple experts in many situations. So if you are under-resourced, if you're at a public defender's office where your boss isn't wanting to fund your expert requests or you're a court appointed lawyer and the court is not giving you money to pay for an expert and you don't have the time to sit and dig through all of the scientific evidence, injustice can absolutely result. Um, and, and some of the, you know, look, some, of, some lawyers who take court appointed cases are not good lawyers, but I think the majority of them are trying really hard to do the right thing. They just have so much other pressure on them that they cannot help. And this goes back to this issue of bias, right? We, we tell ourselves stories um, and we adopt beliefs to, to make our lives work. Uh, we can't help it. We're human beings, we have human brains. And sometimes that can be detrimental to other people. And so while we can't get rid of our biases, what we can do is we can learn to recognize them and we can create a system that accounts for them, that corrects for them. You're now working with the Center for Integrity in Forensic Science as the executive director. Tell me, tell me first how that came, came about. So colleagues of mine were the founders of the center and they, um, and they asked me uh, to, to leave a position I was at at the um, University of Wisconsin Law School to, to run the center. I was so excited about the opportunity because even though we're starting to see um, more research and, um, and, and more knowledge about the way that bad forensic science can lead to wrongful convictions and can lead to unfair trials, um, there aren't very many lawyers who are really working on the front lines of that. And certainly there's no other organization that is exclusively devoted to that challenge. So I, I'm so excited about the opportunity to, to lead this organization um, and hopefully make some really necessary changes. And what is the overall mission of, of your new organization? To make criminal, the criminal trials in the criminal legal system more fair by ensuring accurate, reliable forensic science. What a great mission. And it was co-founded, like I said in the intro, by Dean Strang and Jerome Budding, well known for their defense in Stephen Avery in the Netflix documentary series, Making a Murderer, major hit. Um, how has that series impacted the community fighting against wrongful convictions? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I think that as we see more of these cases come into the mainstream, and certainly making a murderer is part of that, as is um, the uh, the movie about um, the folks who used to be known as the Central Park Five, who are now known as the Exonerated Five. They do, do not wish to be called the Central Park Five anymore. Um, and other important wrongful conviction cases um, I think that as these things permeate into the into the media and and the public learns more about them, that really helps people understand that our legal system is not perfect, um, that we make mistakes, and that that we need to correct for those mistakes when we make them. What was your uh, take on that whole um, show? And uh, just curious, your opinion on Stephen Avery and his guilt or innocence? I have to ask. Well, I don't know enough about the case to render any kind of opinion about guilt or innocence, but I have to tell you that, first of all, okay, so first of all, I should tell you that Jerry and Dean are colleagues and friends, and they, I, I think that they're excellent litigators. They're folks that I look up to um, in, you know, in, in, especially in their trial practice, in their courtroom practice. Um, one thing that really concerns me about that case and, and concerns me about many cases that I see is that is that when some when science is is brought into the courtroom and that science is less than reliable and it is presented as reliable, their the person's trial wasn't fair. If there's a DNA analyst testifying with more certainty um, than the evidence allows, right? Or there's a question about, as there was in Stephen Avery's case, about 
evidence that was lost or fabricated or in some other way tampered with, that that's a real issue because when those things happen, a person's trial wasn't fair. And we have to be able to trust in our system that trials are fair. It's a fundamental principle of our legal system. Um, and, and I think, you know, making a murderer is also really, really helpful in um, kind of the context of DNA evidence, right? Because people think that, so because the National Academies of Science have, have said that DNA evidence is the only kind of forensic evidence that has a rigorous scientific underpinning, right? It's the only, it's the only one. It's not all DNA evidence. It's single source or, or simple mixture nuclear DNA analysis. And so that's one subset of DNA testing that might happen in a criminal case. And as we get further afield from the kinds of DNA testing that have been shown to have a rigorous, strong scientific base, we they become less certain, even though they are DNA. Interesting. Are, so one are you issue where this, oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say one issue where this is starting to come up more and more is in um, computer programs. There are, there are a lot of different names. Um, STR mix, star mix is one, lab retriever. There are a number of other ones called uh, where, where complicated mixtures or small, very, very small amounts of DNA are tested or there's, you know, there's an unknown number of contributors um, to a sample. That is an example of a DNA result that is less reliable, right? Or more questionable than these simple mixtures and single source DNA analysis. So if we lump together um, all DNA, we really miss some of the important nuances and we can, and again, like this is a situation where wrongful convictions can result. Wow. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You're teaching me a ton about DNA right now. and It's fascinating. And, and I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, are you, I don't know if you could track this or just anecdotally, are people now more likely to believe that forensic scientists, DNA evidence, other type of evidence like this can be flawed after watching series like Making a Murderer? That's a great question. Um, without any data, I would have okay. to tell you that I suspect that's true, uh, but but I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I, I suspect, you know, and look, there are plenty of people who watched um, Making a Murderer or any number of other shows about wrongful convictions, and they came to the conclusion that um, that is the opposite, right? That many that many people have come to that that the that the evidence points for guilt, and it's just a really good example of how two people who see the exact same thing can come to two totally different conclusions. And are, is Dean and Jer Jerry still uh, defending uh, criminal uh, people accused of crimes right now? Are they are they more focused on on um, the uh, project that you're working on? No, they both maintain practices, and Dean is also teaching at Loyola Law School right now. Wow, that's that's fantastic. So, where can our viewers and listeners? check out the great work you guys are doing and make those donations like you suggested uh, that you're getting um, to help this type of work. Where, where can they find you? Where can they track all the good stuff you guys are doing? Thank you. Yeah, we're yeah, you can find all of that information at our website, www.cifsjustice.org, sifsjustice.org. And that's the same, um, way to find us on social media. So we're on um, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as sifsjustice.org. Or sifsjustice, sorry. Thank you. And I do have a lot of lawyers who listen and judges because they've commented, they've emailed me. So just give me a, a just a, you, a little bit of a background. If somebody, you know, needs your help, what kind of people um, are you helping? Are you helping, you know, just give, tell me, you know, types of resources you guys offer. Absolutely. So we do training um, for lawyers, judges, and, and that's lawyers for the prosecution and for the defense. Judges, um, anyone involved in the criminal justice system can can work with us um, and get training on some of these issues. We have done trainings for prosecutors' offices to teach them how to recognize when a case um, maybe isn't appropriate for prosecution. Um, we also offer consultation services, so you can. Uh, Call us, fill out the form on our website, or give us a call, send us an email, um, and talk to us about your case. We're happy to answer questions, um, make some recommendations with respect to next steps. 
Um, and in rare cases, we might get involved in some cases as co-counsel. So we've done that before with innocence efforts um, and other organizations where we actually enter and as co-counsel in a case to litigate a particular issue. Awesome. Kate Judson, Executive Director, Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences. I'm going to say that again. Yeah. Kate Judson, Executive Director for the Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences. That's a mouthful. Thank you for being on Open Mic. I learned a ton. I think our listeners and watchers did as well. Keep up the good work. Thank you for all you do. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, that was a that was a doozy. I learned a bunch. I hope you did too. If you know any attorneys, you know anybody, criminal defense attorneys, anybody dealing with someone who was accused of something they didn't do, they may want to hear this, especially if it dealt with forensic science. Like this episode, share this episode. Please subscribe to Open Mic. We're coming up on 100 episodes very soon, so you're not going to want to miss that. And we really appreciate you being here. Have a great day. <laughs>